Welcome to the section on enzymes. Enzymes are specific biologic proteins that catalyze biochemical reactions without altering equilibrium point of reaction or being consumed or changed in composition. We find enzymes in all body tissues and frequently appear in serum following cellular injury or degradation. Some examples of this might be somebody having a heart attack, we would find cardiac enzymes increased in their um, serum after the heart attack. Another one would be some type of liver issue, such as hepatitis. We find an increase of liver enzymes in the bloodstream. Somebody suffering from something like pancreatitis may have amylase and lipase enzymes increased in the serum. So it is very helpful from a clinical diagnostic standpoint to be able to test for these enzymes um, to tell the physician what could potentially be going wrong in the body. Enzymes do exist in many different forms. We can have isoenzymes and isoforms. Sometimes we need things called cofactors, which are necessary for enzyme activity to occur. We need to look at the catalytic mechanism of enzymes moving forward. The active en activation energy is the energy required to raise all molecules in one mole of a compound at a certain temperature to transition state at peak of energy barrier. So enzymes just don't work on their own. There is an energy that needs to happen when the, um, the products come together to create a reaction to happen. I have a quick video here that will depict what this might look like. So the enzymes work as a lock and key type of mechanism. A substrate comes in and causes the reaction to happen. So as you can see here, there are additional things needing to come in to create the reaction to happen. So enzymes don't work on their own unless they have something there to um, that cause this to happen. So that was the um, the picture of the enzyme and product coming or enzymes coming together to create a reaction. I'm going to show you some um, examples of what happened in that video. But for that reaction to happen, we do need some certain things to fall into place. We have to have a specific substrate concentration, specific enzyme concentration. The enzymes are very finicky with pH and temperature. Um, we have inhibitors and activators that cause this enzymatic reaction to happen. And there can be coenzymes and prosthetic groups involved as well. When we look at the reaction happening with an enzyme, we look at a couple different types of things. First, we look at first order kinetics. If an enzyme concentration is fixed and the substrate concentration is varied, then the rate of the reaction is directly proportional to the substrate. You need to memorize that definition. We have an ES complex, which is an enzyme substrate complex that occurs, where the substrate binds to free enzyme at low substrate concentration. The reaction rate continues to increase as more substrate is added. Here's a good picture for those of us that like pictures. We have an enzyme with an active site on it. The substrate comes in, so we have the enzyme plus the substrate. Then we end up with an enzyme substrate complex. As we um, move forward the um, substrate and enzyme, we end up with enzyme and products. At the end of the chemical reaction, we have the enzyme plus the products that are the result of the reaction. You also need to be familiar with the term zero order. This is when the reaction rate depends on the enzyme. This is when the product has formed and the resultant free enzyme immediately combines with excess free substrate. With a zero order reaction, the entire enzyme is bound to a substrate and a much higher reaction is obtained. This is the maximum possible velocity for the reaction. The enzyme concentration does affect the rate of the catalyzed reaction. The more enzyme that is present, usually the faster the reaction. The overall rate of an enzyme reaction in otherwise constant conditions is proportional to the concentration of the enzyme or how much enzyme is present. 
This can be a quantitative determination, as you'll learn in your um, laboratory that you're going to do this week. pH is extremely important when it comes to enzymes. The rate of the chemical reactions is very typically dependent on this. The maximum activity happens in the 7 to 8 pH range. Enzymes are made out of protein. If you subject a protein to a pH that's too acidic or too alkaline, what will happen is you'll denature that protein and it won't function properly. A lot of times in this type of testing, we use a lot of buffers to help control the pH and it will help resist the change of pH. Temperature is another very important factor. The rate of an enzymatic reaction is proportional to its reaction temperature. So if you have a higher temperature, the reaction will go faster. If you have a lower temperature, it will slow down the reaction. You must allow the components to reach temperature equilibrium before proceeding. Whatever the optimum temperature, exactly keeping it controlled is very important. There are different ways that we can take measurements of enzyme activity. The first one is a fixed time reaction. What we would do is we would add the reagent to the patient sample, allow the enzyme to react for a certain amount of time, and then measure the change that has occurred in one fixed time. The other one that we'll be doing this week in our lab is continuous monitoring. This monitors the progress of the reaction continuously. The progress of the conversion of the substrate into products in the presence of an enzyme is monitored through the measurement of decreasing concentration of the substrate or an increasing concentration of products. This is measurable. What we're going to do is keep track of the changing absorbance over time. So we'll take a one minute, a two minute, a three minute, for example, and we'll take the absorbance. From there, we're going to look at the change in absorbance. The faster the change, the more enzyme that is present. The moment at which the enzyme and substrate are mixed, the rate of the reaction is zero. What happens after that is the rate then rises rapidly to a maximum value, remaining constant for a period of time. During the period of constant reaction rate, the rate depends on the enzyme concentration only. And this is independent on the substrate concentration. This is called zero order kinetics. The rate is proportional to the zero power of the substrate concentration. So you're going to find in your lab this week, like I said, if you have more CK present, the reaction is going to happen faster and you're going to have a higher change in absorbance. However, as more substrate is consumed, the reaction rate declines and enters first order kinetics, which is dependent on substrate concentration. Again, I want you to memorize the definition of zero in first order. First order being dependent on the substrate concentration. Other factors that contribute to the decline are the accumulation of products, which can become inhibitors, or an enzyme denaturation and reverse reactions. We do have inhibitors present sometime, which will reduce the reaction rate. It can be reversible or irreversible, depending on where the inhibitor is coming from. We do look at the calculations of enzyme activity differently than we do the other types of tests. The first test that you were that you did was probably something like an albumin where we measured it in grams per deciliter. We are not looking at a quantity of enzyme in this case when we test for them. We're looking at the activity of the enzyme. This is measured in international units. This is the quantity of enzyme that will catalyze the reaction of one micromole of substrate per minute. So we're looking at um, the activity, what's going on, not how much, not a weight per substance. We can also use enzymes as reagents. A lot of our um, reagents, if not all of them, have enzymes in them. We, it drives the reaction to occur to create the color that we get for the spectrophotometer in the cuvette. So um, it's used to measure many non-enzymatic constituents in serum. Okay, so it doesn't mean that we have to use an enzyme and a reagent to test for an enzyme, but things like um, glucose, albumin, all of those use an enzyme in the reagent. It's used to measure analytes that are substrates for corresponding enzyme quantitations and for recoverable reagents as well. Here's a picture of what is happening during an enzymatic reaction. You have your first initial reaction stage. The activation energy that's required reaches peak energy barrier as the enzyme is going. From here then, it will start to drop down, back down to equilibrium. We are going to see how fast this whole process occurs. So now we're going to look at some enzymes of clinical significance. This is where your note cards are really going to become important. 
Um, creatine kinase is the first one we're going to look at. He's very large at 82,000, um, a size of 82,000. He's associated with ATP regeneration and um, transport systems. So he is found in the skeletal muscle, heart muscle, brain tissue. He's of diagnostic significance in things like acute myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, muscular dystrophy, cerebrovascular accidents, seizures, nerve degeneration, shock, hypothyroidism, malignant hyperpyrexia, which is a high temperature, and um, having Rye syndrome, which is a liver issue from um, aspirin ingestion. Here shows the liver enzymes and where they come into play, liver and heart enzymes, with a myocardial infarct. On the left-hand side, we have how high it gets, and on the bottom is the time. So as you can see here, creatine kinase rises very quickly within probably four hours, and it also falls very quickly within four days. Some other enzymes that you see, um, AST, that we'll talk about in a minute, and LDH. Those will um, rise quickly and fall relatively slow, but they're not very specific. We'll get to those in a minute. So CK, um, this one, hemolysis, will be very, um, it will it really interfere with this test. So you make sure you avoid hemolysis. Reference range is 15 to 160 units per liter for a male, a little bit lower for a female. Um, this is found in muscle tissue, and obviously females have a little bit less muscle than men, um, so we find it a little bit less. Creatine kinase has something called isoenzymes, so we do, this, do a so, total CK. The total CK equals the addition of all of these isoenzymes mixed together. So CK equals CKMM, CKMB, and CKBB all added together. Well, the nice thing is that once we give the doctor a total CK, we can also break it down and give him some isoenzymes. So if your total CK is 100, this is just to make it simple, um, if you know a portion of it could be MM, which if it was increased, it could mean myocardial infarction, muscular dystrophy, polymyositis, hypothyroidism, or intramuscular injections. If the MB is increased, it could mean myocardial infarct, having angina or chest pain, ischemia, cardiac surgery, carbon monoxide poisoning. If BB is increased, that's brain and bladder, um, lung, prostate, uterus, colon, stomach, thyroid. So it could be a lot of things. So having an increased CK, we can do the isoenzymes as well to see why the CK is increased. The next one is lactate dehydrogenase, sometimes called LD or LDH. This is found in the heart, liver, skeletal muscle, kidney, and the red blood cells. This is of diagnostic significance, specifically in pernicious anemia, but also in hemolytic disorders, viral hepatitis, cirrhosis, acute myocardial infarction, pulmonary infarct, uh, skeletal muscle disorders, and leukemia. This one has isoenzymes as well, LD1 through 5. Um, specific, some of them are more for heart related, some of them are more for liver related. They can do the isoenzymes to see what portion. Um, this is again hemolysis. Enzymes are very affected by hemolysis. Reference range is 100 to 225. Again, if this test were increased, obviously you can see it affects a number of things, so it wouldn't be very diagnostic. It's not very specific. Next one is aspartate aminotransferase. This one is found in cardiac tissue, liver, and skeletal muscle. We find it a lot in hepatocellular disorders, such as hepatitis and cirrhosis, but we also find it in skeletal muscle disorders. This one, AST, I always see the S in there and think skeletal. I'll tell you why in a minute. So aspartate aminotransferase, AST, also used to be called SGOT. Reference range for this is 5 to 30 units per liter. Here's the one that's similar to AST, it's called ALT. This one's only found in liver, where AST is found in liver and skeletal muscle. So I see the L in here and I think of liver. This one's increased with hepatic disorders and its reference range is 6 to 37. One thing I want to bring up is that if both AST and ALT are extremely elevated, it probably leads you to believe the patient has hepatitis. The next one, Alkaline phosphatase. I have a picture of ELPO up here for a reason. 
It's found in the intestine, liver, bone, spleen, placenta, and kidney. It's of diagnostic significance in um, hepatobiliary and um, bone issues. So if you have biliary tract obstruction or if you have bone issues such as Paget's disease, osteomalacia, rickets, hyperparathyroidism, osteogenic sarcoma, and some of these other disorders, um, it could be increased. Now the nice thing is we can do isoenzymes on this. Um, we can do liver and bone portion. So LD liver and LD bone are the two. If we heat the sample to 56 degrees, bone burns away and liver remains. So we would be able to determine if they in fact had hepatobiliary disease or bone issues. The reason I have the ELPO up here, because this kind of looks like ELPO, and it's liver and bone are the two isoenzymes. Dogs like liver and bone. So that's how my students always memorize that one. Acid phosphatase is the next one, otherwise known as ACP. The tissue source for this is prostate, bone, liver, spleen, kidney, erythrocytes, and platelets. The diagnostic significance is usually prostate cancer. Um, it can be for hyperplasia of the prostate, prostate surgery, having osteoclast, Paget's disease, so it can be a little bit bone related as well. Uh, reference range for this is 0 to 3.5 nanograms per mil. So this is a very, found in very small amounts. The next one, gamma glutamyl transferase, or GGT, is found in the kidney, brain, prostate, pancreas, and liver. The diagnostic significance is hepatobiliary disorders, having hepatic parenchyma alcoholism, or hepatic parenchyma or alcoholism, acute pancreatitis, diabetes, or myocardial infarct. This one, GGT, is very specific for alcoholism. And my students always say, go get tequila. For some reason, GGT, that's what they came up with. So if that helps you memorize the alcoholism, go for it. As you can see, males have a little bit um, higher of a reference range than the females at 6 to 45, where females have 5 to 30. Once again, notice this units per liter. Next one is amylase. This one is found um, in the pancreas and salivary glands. We find it very increased in pancreatitis or sometimes salivary gland lesions. The reference range for this is 25 to 130 and very specific for pancreatitis. Another pancreatitis enzyme is called lipase. This one is found primarily in the pancreas. We find it increased in acute pancreatitis or intra-abdominal diseases, such as ulcers and things like that. Um, this one has a very low reference range of 0 to 1. Some physicians think that lipase elevates after pancreatitis and stays elevated longer than amylase. All right, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. This one is found in the adrenal cortex, spleen, thymus, lymph nodes, lactating mammary glands, and erythrocytes. It's of diagnostic significance with a G6-phosphate um, de dehydrogenase deficiency, which could lead you to some type of megaloblastic anemias. Reference range 10 to 15 um, micrograms of hemoglobin, units per gram of hemoglobin. And that concludes our section on enzymes.